All right, this is Peyton Jones, and I'm with Church Planner Magazine, and I am here with Bob Coy. He is uh, the pastor of Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale. They are one of the fastest growing churches in the state of Florida. And uh, Bob, good to have you. Good to be here, Peyton. Very right. good to be here. Thank you, man. So, Bob, you know, you were just interviewed with uh, Ed Stetzer. Uh, it was a phenomenal uh, interview. A uh, little bit about church planning, about the role of Calvary Chapel and the role of the church planning, how they're really a, a, a church planning movement. Right. But uh, I was fascinated by your story. I would never heard that story until I watched that interview. Um, what's been your journey, man? How did you come to faith and uh, how did you find yourself in the world of church planning? You know, I came to Christ out of a very religious Midwest home environment where um, we know that God exists. We know that the Bible is true, but as far as the practical day-to-day -day expression of that, um, we're, we're more religious than we are spiritual. So I left the world of, let's call it churchianity, religiosity, and I did the world. And I ended up in the recording industry. I worked for Capitol Records for a few years in United Artists. I ended up in Las Vegas, of all places. Um, my journey took me to Sin City, and there I um, really did the life of rock and roll, sex and drugs, until uh, my younger brother moved from California to Las Vegas, and he had gotten uh, religion. He actually had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and I began to look at his life and compare that to my world, and I realized he had everything I was looking for. I just don't know if I was ready for the Jesus thing. That's how it started. Right on. Excellent. And so uh, what, how did you end up, I mean, you, how did you end up church planning? Well, obviously, the more you look at somebody's life, like my brother's, who's doing Christianity right, the more you're intrigued by it. Um, his living room floor, I got on my knees, asked Jesus to come into my life, and I became um, a part of the Calvary Chapel Church there at the time in Las Vegas, Nevada. And I saw how uh, you start with a burden in your heart for a city. The pastor there had a love for the people in Las Vegas, and I and my wife began to pray about where God would lead us. And again, I think and I pray that your viewers start with a burden for a city, not a demographic study, uh, not finding out you know, what the per capita income is and then trying to figure out tide dollars. It's embarrassing if you don't have a burden for the city that you're called to. So we prayed and we continued to pray. And uh, the condensed version is we ended in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, we started a, um, a Bible study midweek and at the same time, we started a Sunday morning church service in a funeral home. Um, I started knocking on doors and asking anybody if I could rent their space. Uh, a very kind-hearted funeral director said, if you want to use this on Sunday mornings, I don't really have a, a fee base. I've never done this before, but it's yours. So that price was right. It didn't cost me anything. And we started Calvary Chapel in a funeral home uh, in Fort Lauderdale uh, probably about 28 years ago. That's awesome. You know, that's that's every church planner's favorite number is free. Yes. And uh, no better place to be, Solomon says, in the house of mourning. So, I mean, that was pretty relevant, preaching a gospel message in a funeral home. It was relevant at the same time it was odd because I would <laughs> pass out flyers with my wife and a few of our first friends in the fellowship down on the beach and say, hey, we're doing a Bible study. And they go, oh, really? Where's it at? Fairchild Funeral Home. <laughs> well, that's a little odd. Uh, but on the other hand, I mean, it was kind of a good thing because I knew that if the dead in Christ rise first and then we who are alive are caught up, I'd actually see it happen. <laughs> happening uh, before anyone else. Uh, yuck, yuck, yuck. Back uh, to you. I got you. Hey, so uh, that's awesome. So, you know, you're, you mentioned your burden earlier for the, for the town. It's so refreshing yeah. to hear you say that. Um, you know, I've, I've kept an eye on you. You are somebody that as you've grown, and I mean, you really do have a massive church. Um, it's very apparent watching all the things that you're involved in that you have kept and maintained that burden. It's not about running a machine to you. It's not about this big giant megalith that you know now has to feed itself. How have you maintained that sense of mission uh, as you've grown? Well, I think that, and if I could say this to those hopeful church planners, look beyond the four walls of your building. You know, there's ministry waiting to happen in every city. Um, when we first started the church, there was this early uh, mindset like, well, now that we're here, 
lost people should come. No, go to lost people. So you've got an audience at the juvenile detention center. If you just volunteer at your local juvenile detention center, you've got an audience. Well, they can't support my ministry and they can't come to church. I don't know that that's what it's about. I think what it's really about is you have a burden for lost people. You go to a city and you want to go to the least, to the last, and to the lost. Find out who is least among us. Find out who is lost as rock, you know, who's far away. Away. And you know what's going to happen? Those early experiences are going to work their way into your Bible study, and people will see that you're the real deal. And when they find out they're the re- you're the real deal, they'll want to join with you in the force to change the world. And, and that's, I think, the commentary on Calvary Chapel. I don't want people just to come to our church. I want people to live the Christian life, and they're not going to live it at our building yeah. or any of our buildings. They're going to live it in the real world, and we need more real-world Christians. That, that's something that comes across through your ministry is that you're very much a mobilizer, a catalyst, and you think about the next generation a lot. Um, talk about your heart for the next generation, what you've been led to do to kind of spread the kingdom. Well, we have a couple of ongoing ministries that I think have been effective. One is a school of worship, and that was the vision of our worship leader who just saw a dearth um, probably 10 years ago of guys that could do more than sing a song. You know, they had to uh, have a heart to lead people into the throne room. And so that school of worship uh, continues to reproduce the kind of um, worship leader that you're hoping, you know, is in the local church. On the other hand, we have this thing called Patmos Reality Discipleship. And it's a discipleship program that is hands-on. You're not in a classroom. You're out in the real world. And we do some zany, crazy, almost illegal things. (laughs) But it's the kind of thing that I think takes the Word of God makes it truly alive in your heart, and there are principles and there are experiences that are unforgettable. And that's what we need to do. We need to do things with the Word and with the next generation that make their experience with God absolutely unforgettable. And, and, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's taking somebody on the street with you. Sometimes it's saying, come with me to the jail. And they see it. Now they're in ministry. It's not just, you know, sit in a classroom. And the more you can do the hands-on stuff, I think, the better it is for everybody. Because it's your experience, it's yeah. their experience, and God's blessing when you go into all the world. Which is probably a way that you've kept yourself kind of more front line as things have kind of developed. Because I, I think what happens a lot of times is as guys uh, kind of grow up, um, you know, the church grows, they become insulated. They almost build a fortress where they're on the inside. And I know that's not true about you. I know that that's something that you strive to be. You and I were at a table where, um, you know, a guy had a seizure right there. And I remember you jumped right in there, man. You're, you know, you're not medically trained at all. Yeah. You're like, boom, right One in. One of those unusual stories. But I have found that if you're willing to be that guy, God will allow those opportunities to happen before your very eyes. And so I'm always kind of like looking around like, okay, why am I here right now? What's going to happen next? And it's kind of like, you know, the the uh, a spiritual punk, you know, where like, wait a minute, I, am I on camera right now? And you, you don't realize it's happening before your very eyes, but it is. And God orchestrates it just so we can, you know, lift the name of Jesus and uh, proclaim his faithfulness. So it's really about being in the moment, in the spirit, wherever you're at, that the spirit of God is working all around you. Describe to me the, the, the influence of the Holy Spirit in your ministry and, and how you've stayed connected to that, how you've stayed reminded of his presence and his power and what you're doing in church planning. Well, what I try and do is remind myself that the Holy Spirit is a person. You know, it's the third equal part of this triune Godhead and not to make him just a force or a wind, but to keep it personal. So practicing his presence, you know, he's with us right now. So if he's with us and he's got amazing power, what does he want to do with that power right now? Is your cameraman saved? I don't know, but I hope he (laughs) is. But if he's not, he might want to save the camera guy. You know what I mean? It's like, don't think just, you know, your thing, think beyond your thing to the thing that he might be doing beyond you. Because you know what? Here's the deal. Even if somebody's found, they're not lost, Amen. they're probably hurting in some form. Everyone I talk to, Peyton, has got something going on in their life right now. And when you get close enough to the Spirit to find out that person could use an encouraging word, that person is going through something financially, that person, their daughter just ran away from home. I mean, all that stuff. 
I want to be an agent of grace and peace and love and mercy. The only way to do that is to try your best. And I'm not saying like I got it, but to try your best to stay in tune with the spirit. Amen. And and if you make him a person and kind of like, like he's here, and I'm not, I'm not saying this is the spirit, my imaginary friend. I'm saying the spirit is real. And if you think in terms of practicing his presence, I think it helps. Yeah, and, and what's interesting is a lot of guys think, oh, when I get where, you know, Bob is, then, you know, I'll really be in the middle of everything. But what you're saying is, no, where you're at now, yeah. don't wait for that. Oh, but I'll even say it's harder because what happens, you get my position and it's easy to default to letting somebody else do it. And you can easily distribute ministry and go, I'm giving you a chance. I'm giving you a chance. Well, what are you doing? Well, remember, it was in spring when kings go to war that David decided to kind of kick back yeah. and do the Bathsheba thing. He was supposed to be going to war, some would say, but it was his bros, his elders that said, hey, Dave, we're worried about what happens when you go out to war. Why don't you kick back? He took somebody else's advice. And, and you know, the, the rest is, is history, they say. So I think that I got to be at war. I brought some young people with me to the conference i think that the more you you know are around that element the yeah. more they sharpen you because they'll show you their thing and you'll see um, your thing through their eyes i think it helps there was a moment for you that i heard in your interview recently where uh you had to learn that lesson where you were church planning in fort lauderdale um you know it was a time where church planning you know church planning is kind of sexy now yeah. You know, guys are going in because oh, it's, it's a very groovy thing. It's yes. cool. Yes, it's, you it know, is. but but when you guys did that, right? Right. It wasn't cool. It wasn't right. talked about. It was frontline. It was commando. And it sucked. Yeah. Right. While yeah. you're doing it. Yeah. So tell me about how God, because uh, when I heard that story, exactly the lesson you're, you're pulling yeah. around right now, it's kind of something the Lord taught you then. Yeah. And it was when you were, uh, can you tell that story? Well, I'd like to say to anyone who's thinking in terms of ch church planting that, and this is going to make some people weird and I'll get email, but <laughs> the less you are dependent on others and the more dependent you are on God, the better position you're in. I think, you know, I talk to guys these days and like I mentioned previously, you know, this is demographic study it's getting support it's raising funds it's you know all of this stuff that is kind of a false uh, confidence infrastructure where it, the more you're dependent upon God so you know everything's happening Calvary Chapel wise on the West Coast my wife and I moved to Florida completely the other side of the planet so to speak I think that was like holy God because we really had to depend upon the Lord. We had yeah. to get John Doe jobs, you know? It's like, I'm working. Yeah, of course you're working. Well, I started to study. Well, what does Calvary Chapel do for guys that plant church? We'll pray for you. It's like, uh, is there money? Is there insurance? Uh, can I, you know, get some, you know, false sense of hope from you guys believing that I'm a great guy? None of that, because I think it's wise. I, I think it's smart and I'm thankful, but I would say, um, you know, my senior pastor, Chuck Smith, has always said it takes two years to lay the foundation and the third year you see the growth. And it was in that third so year time span where I'm thinking, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm still working uh, the regular job and um, my wife's working a regular job. And when things are tight financially, but you're serving the Lord and you feel like you're really alone. And it's like, what is the mothership doing for this, you know, satellite expression uh, and, and you don't really feel that, let me tell you something. Those, my friend, are the days of rude awakening. Who are you in Christ? Who is Jesus to you? How powerful is God? Uh, what is he capable and able of doing? All those things are going to be answered in you. Yeah. It's about you and Jesus. Yeah. It's not about throw up the, uh, you know, the shingle and have it say Calvary Chapel and everybody goes, oh, you must be enough like Chuck. I'm going to come. No, I wasn't like Chuck. So in that third year, the, the readiness to quit and to give up was there. And uh, I think the part of the story you want me to share for the hopeful church planners is I'm, I'm weeks away from just tossing the towel. And I call out to Costa Mesa and my determination is, um, you know, find out who else wants to do this thing. We got about 40, 50 people here. It's been two and a half years and I'm done. And uh, Odin Fong, was uh, the guy who answered the phone out at the Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa Church. And as we began a dialogue, you know, a little bit about my, you know, tired of this and maybe there's another opportunity for me, he surprised me and he said, um, well, go ahead and go. And I said, now, what do you mean? He goes, well, God doesn't want like a, a poor mouth burdened pastor. You know, if you don't feel like these people like you, you know, leave. And it was like, really? 
<laughs> and I thought he was going to give me one of those battle hymn of the Republic in the background. Yeah. You know, you can pep do it talk. speeches. You know, pep talk. Bobby, you're good. You know, you're anointed. <laughs> they he need didn't do you. That. He said, leave. And then he said this. I'll never forget it. He goes, you know, we got Bible college students out here that would really be happy loving on 40 people. So anytime you're ready to go, let me know. <laughs> and I hung up the phone and was like... <laughs> can't be can't be and it's funny because my wife uh, said to me afterwards she said well how was that as an experience I said it was horrible he told me I could leave <laughs> she goes well do you want to and I said you know what um, ain't no Bible college gonna student gonna come out here and care for these 40 people and these are mine man these are mine and it was pivotal it was really pivotal yeah. and um, I'll add to it although it's a longer story you know some real inner like who am I am I really gonna do this? in other words what if you only get 40 people are you okay with that hmm. you know what if it only what if it caps at a hundred are you okay with that in other words why are you in the ministry are you in the ministry to get famous are you in the ministry to declare faithfulness you know and that was the key for me and yeah. I you know it was an odd thing Peyton but because that week I think when I said Lord this will be my hometown I will call Fort Lauderdale my home and these will be the people that I, I minister to, everything started to turn around and the church started growing. And quite honestly, and I'm thankful to say this, it has not stopped growing. You know, yeah. this year we're bigger than we were last year. And that's not like, hey, pat myself on the back. That's to say lost people are still being found yeah. at this thing called Calvary Chapel. So and, I'm, and I'm, I'm, pl I'm pleased with God allowing that to happen. And I know for a fact that a lot of the church planners that are in Florida that I talk to will testify that when they're planning, the people that support them the most and the people that join their team and are the biggest helper guys trained in Fort Lauderdale. Mm. That that is a common mm. thing. So you guys, I mean, it's I don't think honor. I don't think some people realize how massive you guys are. Yeah. But that is your heart. You keep those people focused on mission. And I know planners out in the field that are grateful for that focus that you've trained Christians up. When they come through the doors, they're not consumerists. Yeah. They come as missionaries, well, and they come and get their that. hands dirty. Thank you very, very much. Um, Bob, before we uh, end here, tell me about the bridge experience. Yeah, well, as you allude to it, it was part of that whole I'll give up and I'm ready to toss in the towel experience. I had a little Volkswagen bug at the time, no air conditioning, uh, Florida, <laughs> hot. I'm working late at night, you know, I have to set up in the elementary school for church on Sunday morning. So there are a lot of reasons for me to say uh, I'm done. And uh, Greg Laurie, uh, the uh, pastor of the Harvest Christian Fellowship, has always played a very interesting role in my life as a spiritual, you know, kind of like, uh, look at the way Greg's doing it, as well as Pastor Chuck. But he was on the radio, and I didn't know he was on the radio. And I had a little AM radio in my VW Bug, and I'm twisting it. And it was in that week of real confusion. Um, and I hear his voice. And uh, he makes the comment, and it was almost like um, divinely placed. It's almost like God used an editing tool and just said, I'm going to put this slice in right about the time that Bob turns the dial. And Greg said, you keep on looking for grass that's greener on the other side. Why don't you just bloom where you're planted? Hmm. And I know that's not that's not a verse, you know, but God would use that Amen. in my life. And I pulled my little VW Bug to the side of the road, and and there's not like any high points in Florida. It's all pretty flat. But this was a bridge over another highway, and I got out of my car and I walked over to the edge, and you know, as high up as you could see you know, from Flatland, Florida. Um, I began weeping and you know I kid and say I'm sure that other drivers thought you know he's gonna jump off uh, but I didn't jump off and it was at that moment in my life where I really did declare to God I will bloom here here's where you placed me I'm gonna stick my roots in and see what happens when I'm wholly surrendered and that's that's that growth factor yeah and I remember uh, you saying at one stage when you're standing on that on that bridge, you look out and you just almost in frustration, maybe exasperation, just said, I'm not leaving. Yeah. I'm not leaving. Like yeah. hell or high water. I'm here, man. Yeah, this you is know, it. I'm committed. And it's a cool, weird thing because now that I'm more, more of an old guy than a young guy, and I will say to those church planners, I think what that's said to our community in Fort Lauderdale is, Coy's really there. And, you know, it's a cool thing now because I'll say um, at the end of a Bible study, you know, if you reject Jesus today, you know, and you walk away from him, know this, he still loves you. And know Amen. this, we'll still be here next week. And we'll be here next year. And when you say that kind of thing, 
there's something about the staying power of God that he doesn't move easily that I think the church also needs to say because sadly so many of these church plant guys you know they go there for a year it doesn't pop for them and they go someplace else and they're missing that third year growth thing because they didn't continue to plow they continued to, to not pray and so they're not going to see the fruit because there was no real investment you gotta dig deep so pray first find out where he wants you Pray second, now that you want me here, I'm here. And then go beyond the four walls of your building. Don't look at your church as the place where you do ministry. Look at the city as the place where you do the ministry. Awesome. And you know, it's funny because you identified a, a real pattern that the first year is kind of exciting because it's new and it's it's you're building a team oh, yeah. and it's popping. And yeah. First person gets saved. People are still praying for you that don't know you. It's like, oh, I'm praying for you. Oh, that's great. You know, people from the church you yeah. left or something. It's like, and then the yeah. second, second year, year like second year is the toughest part. Lonely. That's when your people yeah. leave. But the third year is growth. And yeah. thanks for identifying that because yeah. I think a lot of people need to know stay the course. For me, I've I've been a part of eight church plants. I'm a serial yeah. church planter. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how many times I'm in a church plant. Each time, the Spirit has to tell me, endure. Yeah. Endure oh, hardship. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. do not abandon your post. Well, and then the other thing that I kind of close with is this. If after three years, there's 20 people, in my opinion, it's still 20 more than you deserve, man. Amen, <laughs> it's brother. Like Amen. Anyone shows up at all still surprises me. It's like I'll look out the parking lot and go, this many people woke up on Sunday morning to come here. This is still strange to me. Who really should? Nobody. So I'm and, still and in the grace of God. And if anyone stays, if 20 people oh, stay, that goodness. ain't you. That ain't you. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Amen. Bob, thanks so much, man. Thank you, God bless very, you. Very, very much. Absolutely. Right. God bless you.